I would like to ask you to open your Bibles in the first book of the Bible, the beginnings, Genesis. And I would like to read, uh, to, to begin this reflection about the vision um, on Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. I would like to, to ask, um, maybe, <coughs> uh, Sharon, can you read Genesis 2.15, please, for us? It's very small, yeah. Thank you. The Lord took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it <coughs> and take care of it. Well, um, January is our vision month. So we have been doing several years now. And as your pastor, I need to tell you about the vision of this church. Uh, we have new people here. We we need to refresh our um, minds with the vision we believe God gave us and we have embraced earnestly as the itinerary of, of this church for the coming years. And we as leadership team want to share from our hearts to your heart about our church present and uh, desired future. And last week, Ken... Uh, Benson, um, our elder, introduced a, the vision by applying it to a very important biblical episode, one of the most beautiful and transformative encounters of Jesus <coughs> with an individual. And today I will, I will be sharing, I, I will be trying, I will try to share um, about the biblical foundations for that same vision. Uh, which describes the way of Jesus. When you come through the doors, um, there's a banner over there. I don't know if you um, are too familiar already with the building and, and you don't notice that we have a banner that says exactly, that states the vision. Loving God, loving people, making disciples. Um, and, and you know, as... As we understand uh, more about this vision, I'm in love with what God told us as a church to do. That's our vision. And I want to explain it. Um, we are still convinced that the Holy Spirit has been calling us to love God, to love people, and make disciples. And this vision is, as you know, taken from two main passages of scripture, Matthew 22, uh, verse 36 to 40, the great commandment. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. And this is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. So from this scripture, we learn about loving God and loving people. Then from the Great Commission, uh, you know this passage quite well, uh, the Great Commission in Matthew, <coughs> Matthew 28, 19, and 20, we get the commandment to make disciples. And Jesus said, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. So this vision statement is something that is really um, based on Scripture, in something that it's very basic to understand the role of the church. And this vision statement that we have now was tweaked in 2012 because Christ Church is an organic body that is always changing and adjusting. And the need to become a semper reformanda type of church is, is explicit in the statement offered by Caster Brewing who said, 
um, to stop uh, to stop changing is to die. To stop changing is to die. So ignoring the already here reality is extremely dangerous. For, and, and, and you need to understand, for those who have not been here for too long, Gormley Church was historically a farming community church planted in a faith-based Mennonite community that it's not here anymore. This is totally different now. And consequently, after one, 144 years of ministry in this uh, place, in this hamlet, we have to adjust our church mission, but not our identity as an evangelical, as, an, uh, as a missionary church. So in the last couple of years, our leadership team has been driving us through a process of definition of a strategic question, which is knowing that God is calling us to pursue the vision of loving God, loving people, making disciples. How should we respond to God's calling in this particular time and in this very community? Please understand that even something that seems very, very... Um, pragmatic like the renovation of, of a building like this, it's not just something we do by chance. It's related with this vision. We want a place that will facilitate the vision, the fulfillment of the vision, loving God, loving people, making disciples. So before uh, going any further, let me say that I don't ignore the already here reality. I'm aware that in 2017, once again, we lost some families. We lost the Cliffords, and we suffered. We grieved with that. Uh, we lost also the Abernathys. They moved to Stouffville for, uh, you know, a better place for them. Uh, um, residents, uh, assisted residents, whatever you call it. Um, in 2017, we, we also <coughs> lost C Cameron Bryson, uh, who passed, passed away. Uh, and you know, for a pastor, it's always difficult, always difficult to lose these uh, beloved brothers and sisters. Uh, as you know, some of them key leaders, uh, Jay and Jesse. Uh, in a church of our size, it's quite significant. However, you know, God is so good. God is so good. And he has been affirming the vision that he gave us. God is so good that he blessed us in 2017 with four baptisms, seven new members, and ten, ten new regular congregants. Isn't that amazing? God is the head of the church. And in spite of this pastor, he is more interested to fulfill the vision that he has for this church than myself. I firmly believe that he will build his church in 2018. I strongly believe in the growth of this family church as we increase ownership of the vision God gave us. I'm convinced that the majority of our congregation is willing, willing to move forward, respecting who we are, our, our history, our values, keeping our biblical values, because they know, they know, each one of those who are ready to move forward, they know that keeping the status quo that has been leading us sometimes to discouragement or even slow death is not an option. We need to move forward. So we have a metaphor. We have a vision and we have a metaphor. Our ministry metaphor is planting gardens <coughs> the way of Jesus. And let me explain this to you. In 2015, God gave us a new metaphor to pursue the vision 
of loving God, loving people, making disciples. Because it's quite easy to state a vision, but how can you do that? How can you fulfill that vision? And let me describe how I believe God has been leading us to deal with the challenges of implementing a God-given vision. And since 2015, we, we adopted a ministry metaphor that is very common for some of, you, of us. It is the one of organically growing gardens by planting seeds. And here, once again, we are respecting our history. Considering the fact that our congregation is placed in a traditional farming community, many of us understand the virtues, virtues of such an image. And this metaphor includes the assumption that we need to depend on God in everything we do. Because everything is uncertain. Well, you can, you can, you can ask us, what was our feelings? What were our um, situation? What was our situation last weekend? Everything is so uncertain. In a in a a moment, you just you just don't know what's going to happen next. And farmers are experts on how to live with instability, with uncertainty. How much control do we have over the risks a farm business is exposed to? Who can control the global grain prices? Who can control the market and particularly the weather? Who can control that? The sources of risk on a farm are numerous and diverse. So a farming business is a very complex system, as you know, and the church is exactly the same. It is made up of a mix of people. Uh, now, talking about the farming business, it, it's a, a livestock, n natural resources, technology, e e economics, finances. But there are simple rules and stages in the farmer's business that nobody can avoid if we want to succeed in the farming business. Reaping a harvest is the outcome of a lengthy series of events that cannot be bypassed or, or overlooked. And, and in 2015, when we started this conversation, we spent the whole year talking about the four stages of the farming process. Preparing the soil is the first one. Uh, unless the ground is cleared and plowed, it, it will not be ready to receive the seeds. The second stage is sowing the seeds. The third stage is to cultivate the soil. Cultivation is the lengthiest part of the agricultural process since it involves irrigation, fertilization, weed control. And the last one is reaping the harvest. Harvest is effective only at one stage. So based on, on these four agricultural principles, we established a ministry basis that it is organic and that facilitates, we believe, spiritual transformation. We need to be patient. I need to be patient. I can't just skip some of the stages of this farming metaphor. But I believe the remarkable thing, remarkable thing about this ministry metaphor is that it's biblical. And it's biblical sounds and profoundly missional. That's why I love it. So when I say planting gardens in the way of Jesus, I'm talking about Genesis 2.15. And I'm talking about 1 Corinthians 3, 5 to 9. And so let me explain that in detail. Um, uh, These are the four uh, stages, um, as you know. Um, 
But let me explain according to uh, Genesis 2.15. God loves and creates gardens. I believe God is green. God is a gardener. Because he is the one who began the gardening process of creation. In the first two chapters of Genesis, we learn that God's hands are dirty from garden care, shaping and creating from the soil. God the gardener takes clay, breathes into clay, and creates Adam. God created human beings and placed them in a garden. In that place, it is a paradise because it is the place where humans can walk, talk, and meet God in intimacy. So Bernard Shaw once said that the best place to seek God is in a garden. Uh, according to Ron Rush, the Bible presents at least four gardens. And the first garden is the Garden of Eden, obviously. God created man to have a relationship and, and walked in the garden with Adam and Eve. He made the garden uh, um, a place of provision, protection, and absolute freedom. The tree of life is mentioned, as you know. But you know what happened there. The created ones fell into sin, which means death, and lost the garden. Then the Bible presents a second garden, and that's a, a very important one, the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus was familiar with this garden by going there with his disciples and his, his alone times with the Father. It was in this garden where Jesus had his greatest struggle, but surrendered to the Father's will. The third garden is beside Golgotha. In John 19, the tomb was in a garden near Golgotha. Interestingly, this becomes the garden of the resurrection. So God the gardener, who planted the garden in Eden, raised Jesus, the new Adam, to new life in a garden. And this, fa this fact transfers the function of God the gardener to Christ the gardener. So the fourth garden, let me tell you, the fourth garden in the Bible is in the glory of God. You need to read Revelation 22. The tree of life is mentioned in the new heaven. And in Revelation 22, we see the tree of life on both sides of the river of the water of life. And it bears 12 crops of fruit for every month. Pointing again to God's provision. The leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Showing that God is a God of restoration. And He will restore the nations. Amen. Isn't that amazing? Is. Thank you, Lord. In the first garden, we lost the face-to-face -face contact with God. But we will have the face, that face-to-face -face relationship again. Another interesting detail is that every garden represents a stage in life and God is in every garden. So because of the resurrection, we have the hope of being restored right now in a personal relationship with Jesus and we can follow Him as Lord until we return to the future hope of seeing Jesus face to face. There is hope in every garden. Hallelujah. We are God's fellow. Oh, I'm not showing all the pictures. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. Let me ask someone else to open 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Um, Dr. Bill, can you read 1 Corinthians 3, 5 to 9? Just to give me a chance to drink some water here. 1 Corinthians 3, 5 to 9. What is Paul? Servants to whom you believe, as the Lord assigned to me. I planted all the water, but God gave it. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive the wages according to his labor. 
are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. So, you know, this is the metaphor for us. We are God's fellow gardeners. That's what we are. According to the Apostle Paul, we are God's fellow workers in God's fields. And as part of His church, we work for God as God's fellow workers. God is responsible for all the work, but as His gardeners, we have an important role to play. We are the sowers with the best seed ever. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the seed. We are called to get our hands dirty and plant gardens. Plant seeds. Plant the gospel in people's hearts. In the way of Jesus. So planting gardens means to plant seeds of life. To invest in those who are not yet in the kingdom. To share and to love people. To embrace God's mission in this world. Because God is waiting for you to plant a seed, to plant a garden. So, let me tell you. If our church is not growing as you would like. Stop complaining. Amen. Plant seeds. Amen. What does a farmer do uh, when he's, he's got a barren field that is producing zero, no income. He doesn't complain about it. He doesn't even pray about it. He just goes out and starts preparing the soil and planting the seeds, the seeds because he knows nothing is going to happen until he plants the first seed. He can pray all he wants, but it's not going to produce fruit. It's He's got to plant, to plant the first seed. And some of you are waiting on God to see something happening at Gormley Church. You think you are waiting on God for church growth. You think you are waiting on God to see a particular ministry growing. You think you are waiting on God for the windfall. But Rick Warren talking about this once said, God says, you think you are waiting on me? I'm waiting on you. I'm waiting for you to plant a seed, to plant a garden. Everything in life starts as a seed. Think for a moment. Everything in life starts as a seed, a relationship, a marriage. A business, a child, a church. Nothing happens until the seed is planted. So why does God require us to plant gardens in the way of Jesus? Because planting is an act of faith. You take what you've got and you give it away. That takes faith. That's why this year... I thought that the Spirit of God was leading me to, to prepare a sermon series for the whole year about outrageous faith. We need to grow in our faith to bring glory to God. So when you plant seeds in the kingdom of God, you do not work for yourself or even for one another. You plant for God. And, and as gardeners, we all have different roles and responsibilities in God's garden. Some plant, some water, some have up front gifts, and some serve behind the scenes. However, all servants are equally important. As gardeners, we are all one in God's program. There are no exceptions. We are not to compete against each other. Instead, we are to complement each other. We all need one another to fulfill God's work. So to the degree that we are faithful garden tools, God will grant us eternal rewards. That's what verse 8 says. The man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose, and each will be rewarded according to his own labor. Let me finish by saying that God is the one who makes gardens grow. Let's not forget this. If I will 
if I would miss this point in my own theology, if I would ignore this, I would be depressed. If I would ignore this, I would quit. But I believe that God is really the one who makes gardens grow. It's not about the pastor. It's not about the, the members. It's not about the budget. It's not about the building. This obviously can't be an excuse for me as a leader. This can't be an excuse for me as a gardener. We need to work hard, as any farmer does, but we can't ignore that only God can cause the growth. We are the means by which people believe, but God is the one who, who changes people's lives. He alone establishes if and when a person believes in Jesus Christ. I can use all my good arguments and nothing happens. God is the one who causes the growth, but He will not exclude you from the process. We as sowers need to start 2018 by renewing our commitment, our willingness to serve as God's fellow workers in His harvest, expecting Him to bless us. Are you ready? Are you ready to prepare the soil of your own hearts and undertake with perseverance a long-term commitment to God's garden? Are you willing to get your hands dirty? Don't forget that mankind started when our God got his hands dirt. The challenge, the challenge ahead of us is huge. Farming is everything but easy. I'm talking of preparing the soil, sowing the seed of the gospel, cultivating the ground, and then to reap a huge harvest. But to be prepared, we need to learn the way of Jesus. And this pastor cannot and do not want to control the harvest. We depend on the Lord of the harvest. As, as your pastor, I want just to do something here. To offer encouragement and to equip you as, as we challenge one another to follow Jesus together. In His way. I'm not the owner of the harvest. I'm not the owner of Gormley Church. I cannot control the quality of the crop. But we all need to learn how to select the best seeds how to plant them, and how we will rely on God for a great harvest. My goal is to equip, not to control. The leadership team um, has a role to be facilitators of seed sowers that will encourage interactions with one another. So as we grow in, in our dependence on the God of the harvest, I, I want, I keep saying this, I want to see a church that grows larger on Sunday mornings, reflecting the ethnic diversity of Richmond Hill. And God is bringing them. Some years ago, we didn't have an Asian person in this congregation. And they're quite, you know, um, we have a good number of Asians in Richmond Hill. I don't know if you noticed that. Well, I want to see uh, a congregation on Sunday mornings that reflects the diversity of Richmond Hill. But also, a church that grows smaller. Grows smaller during the week by involving everyone in what we call DNA groups, triads, groups of three people who are learning the way of Jesus together, but also missional communities who will meet once a month to do mission together. And Warder and I, we have been dreaming about a missional community that will focus on newcomers 
That's why we are trying to suggest that um, on the last Sunday of this month, we want to invite uh, those who want to join us on that missional community and everybody from the congregation to experience what it means to be part of a worship service uh, in a different language. Have you, have you ever tried that? Uh, and, but I can assure you that at least the sermon will be translated into English. And you know, we will have a, a couple from Brazil who just decided to sold everything and they have been traveling all around the world just to do one thing, to release the love of Jesus. And they will stay with us for a few days to serve our church. And they will be here on the last Sunday of January to, to talk about being a foreigner and be welcomed. That's what we want to see. A church that grows larger on Sunday mornings that reflects the ethnic diversity of our town, Richmond Hill, but at, at the same time, grow smaller, smaller during the week with DNA groups and missional communities. As we grow in our dependence on the God of the harvest, I want to see Gormley as a multi-generational and multi-ethnic church that gathers together on Sundays, opens the Bible to learn the gospel, experience transformation, express love for Jesus in different and creative ways. But during the week, we are scattered among the community and the marketplace, and we will make disciples who make disciples of different ethnic groups, using our church building to serve the, emigrant, the immigrants, the poor, the elderly, and let me share just a crazy idea. I, I, I still have the dream that this church can be used in planting new churches by the power of the Holy Spirit. We have the best seed ever. Let's do it. Let's get our hands dirty. Amen. Father, help us. This is your vision. This is not my vision. That's my vision now because you gave it to me. You gave it to my brothers and sisters. So Lord, help us to rely on you, to depend on you, and to trust that what you promised, you will do. Help us to be patient. Help us to be faithful as a farmer. Help us to work hard, to be committed, and create in our hearts the expectation of a huge harvest. Because the world is in such a need of that seed, your love, your gospel. Thank you, Jesus, to uh, trust to people like me and my brothers and sisters here, this amazing mission of making disciples. Lord, we will do that in your power, loving you first and foremost, and loving people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.